Well, hello there, person. Let's check out what's new. Making the game Wraithbinder. We'll start off with a couple fun things, and then I'll show you something that I've been really focusing on lately that's going to help tremendously um, with being a one-man studio and getting enough done that it feels like I'm a, more than just a one-man studio. Um, but let's start with the fun stuff here. First, first thing, this is an idea, thanks to Peter, um, who works at Double Eleven, um, to make it so when you create blocks, they will actually make arrows bounce off of them. So before you had this ability to create all sorts of buildings with your Skybot. Um, whoa. Now we gotta get the sword here, get some ma some matter points. There we go. Okay, so you could build like a bridge, a mine, or a block as the first things you can build. The block is basically just this little. I gotta turn. There we go. A block is just one of these pillars, right? But now, see how the the arrow bounced off the block? I build another one over here. Ah, it's so cool. So. Whenever arrows hit your blocks, they just bounce off, which makes it adds another um, usefulness, a, a purpose for these blocks. Before you could create walls surrounding your um, any sort of building, you could create uh, different pathways with blocks. But now you've got the ability to um, build a block and then have it block arrows. Oh well. Okay, so um, another fun thing is we've got better. Um, first of all, you can you can cycle through which menu you're on by pressing repeatedly pressing the the button to get into the menu. So right now my button to get into the menu, I'm using the keyboard is W, and I can just repeatedly press W to go through all my menus. That's kind of a more convenient thing. And then um, on the mini map, this is neat too. Um, it's much more clear where you are and where your base is. So before we didn't have this this flashing U in base, which said P1, P2, P3, which was it really did not help at all to figure out where the heck your base was. The thing is, sometimes you're going to glance at the mini map and go, "Where the heck was my base?" Right? That's one of the first things you're wondering when you're playing. You're like low on health. You're scrambling to get some more health. You're like, what the heck? I gotta go back to my base. And you access the big mini map, and it's like, how do you get to your base, right? So now it's much more clear where the heck your base is because it flashes the word base wherever your base is. And in fact, if I go and steal a base, let's go and um, oh, I keep building mines over here. I'm gonna try and knock this guy off. Of, there we go. Now we'll steal this base here. But before I die, Jesus, getting it with lightning over and over. Here we go. Come on, come on, come on. Yes. All right. We stole this base. Now we have this mender here. And um, let's walk off a little bit so we can make sure that. Yep. There, okay. So I had to walk off a little bit just to make sure that my word you is not covering up the word base right there. So but basically what's happening is we've got, now I've got a base where I started, which is the, the larger pink area. And then we've also got this other pink area where I just stole a base, which is now um, my base as well. Um, we can see that there's player three goes over there near the item chest and I'm over here on the left in this greenish area. So much more clear what the heck's going on on the mini map. That's a really, really cool bonus as well as the, uh, the whole um, um, blocking arrows with blocks. So, um, gosh, there's many more things to go through in this, in this change log, but done a lot of things here. But let's look at something really, um, this is something that really puts a lot of peace of mind in my soul. Um, but it also is something that helps me be make sure that I'm putting out a quality game, right? What uh, what I'm leveraging here is automation. So 
um, I'm taking advantage of the fact that I can just leave my computer on at night and have it do stuff for me that helps my business, that helps my video games, that helps you as a fan of my video games and player of my video games to make higher quality video games. This is something that every single night it call, on weekdays it, I, it runs this. It's called Make Platforms. This is basically a script which goes through and makes the game for Mac in debug. Then it goes and makes the game uh, in release uh, in release mode for Mac as well. So we've got uh, um, debug and release for Mac, and then we've also got debug and release for Windows, and I can add in the Linux platform as well. I did this for Songbringer, and this was a huge relief because I was always, uh, as I was starting to release Songbringer, I was getting the thing is you get lots of players playing your video game, and it as a developer that's kind of nerve wracking in a way. It's like, hmm. Is what is what I've done today? The code that I checked in. Did I just break something? Did I just did I just ruin a player's experience by the code that I checked in today? That I thought improved things, right? Because you're always wondering that. Like one little line of code can affect so much. So what this does is it builds it builds the game for all these platforms and then runs the game as well, and produces a report for me every single morning. I look at this report and it tells me what happened. And check this out, it even launches the game the game to build it on Windows, so I've got Parallels running here. And um, this is actually automatically launches Parallels, it goes in and does a batch script on Windows 10 to rebuild the entire game. And um, so it rebuilds in, in debug and release modes and checks the errors. And, uh, and then even better, what it's going to do here in a second is it's going to run the game on all these platforms as well, actually just the release mode versions. But it does so in a production-like environment, which means that basically it's just starting over from scratch. It uses a brand new save file in a brand new folder. It's running the game as if it were a new player. And, um, and that just gives me so much peace of mind that I'm producing a quality product. And it's something that doesn't cost me any time, right? After I've already written this entire build script and all these things to do this stuff, this automation is, is saving me time and helping me produce a quality uh, product. Also, also, this is a really huge thing for um, when you go to even more platforms. So it, um, my last game, Songbringer, was uh, published by Double Eleven. They're my amazing publisher. I love these guys. And Double Eleven uh, put the game on Xbox and uh, PlayStation 4 and, um, and even Nintendo Switch. So uh, when you're going on those many platforms as well, it also really, really helps to have any sort of automation going that helps you produce like higher quality code because that is even more nerve wracking when you have your game going out on all these platforms. Um, this is just something that helps me have peace of mind as a developer, but it also helps me to just make sure that the code that I'm checking in to not only my own uh, code base, but also Double Double Eleven will have their own code base version of this video game because they have to they have to use their own engine to get the game on pla PlayStation and Xbox and all that. So it's a really really big win for everybody, for players, for myself, and um, and for Double Eleven, my publisher. So um, this is how I'm leveraging automation to give myself more peace of mind as a developer and produce a higher quality product. Now, there's another thing that I'm working on. Um, this will also help, uh, this will help in a couple different ways. Um, there, it's, it's, I'm working on something called uh, basically playback. So the ability to record your game, your match, and then play it back exactly as if, as it were, was, was uh, played. So um, let's look at some of this code and, and whatnot's going on here with that. Um, let's look at one of these scene files. So if I run the game with a certain switch on, it will um, produce a scene file. And this is what a scene file looks like. Basically, it's got it's a lot like a saves file. A saves file is basically just has some settings, and then it also has some bindings, and it also has save data for all your characters. A scene file is just basically about the same thing, except that it overwrites all your settings and everything when it runs the scene. And it also starts screen recording every time it, it runs one of these scenes. So what I can do with this is make a, make a GIF file. 
And this is part of my nightly automation is it will go and not only produce the build for all these different platforms, but it'll produce GIFs. So it'll actually record the game and produce and save a bunch of ping files for all the screenshots. It'll just keep on keep on pumping out ping files and then and once it's done it produces a gif uh, from those ping files and and this is um make gif I'll show you what I'm talking about here make gif it's basically just a script that um, cleans up the screen path the, the screen cap folder and then it runs the game with the scene and then goes and produces a gif file this gif is a script that I basically created Oops. That um, basically what it does is it goes and takes all those ping files, and it keeps on producing a GIF GIFs until it gets one that's underneath 15 megabytes. This is kind of a. This is all because of Twitter. So this is really all for for to help me um, do marketing better. Um, basically, I can be really lazy about marketing. And um, what I'm trying to do for myself and to make myself produce more GIFs and put more stuff on Twitter and social media is to, to use this nightly automation to produce um, GIFs so that I can easily in the, in the morning wake up and go, wow, look at this, I've got all these different GIFs I could just go and upload right now. So this is, one, this is the original GIF right here. This basically is the scene zero that we were just looking at a second ago. It basically just runs the game in practice mode and rotates the camera around. And you can see that here in scene zero um, with the input. It's basically just it's pressing the left two a bunch of times to rotate the camera. And this is the tick number. So at tick number 146 for player zero, which is player one actually, uh, press the left two key and there's no vector input. And then at tick 156 for player zero, uh, stop pressing the left two button. So that's how that it runs through that that sort of the scene is like a almost like a script of different buttons that can be pressed. And um, and then it uses this old GIF utility here to go ahead and crop and add in different signature uh, overlays and then get them get that GIF all the way down to f just under 15 megabytes. So. Um, the goal is eventually to have a whole bunch of different scenes recorded. Right now, I've just got this one scene recorded, so I can produce this one GIF file at night. Um, but the, the eventual goal is to be able to have a, just a folder full of all these GIF files, and I could go, hmm, every morning I could go, hmm, maybe I'll, produce, maybe I'll post this GIF right now, just to make it easier for myself and enable me to do better marketing. Because it's it's very important. No matter if you even have a publisher, it's very important to do your own marketing as a as an indie developer and to just be involved in that process because it just opens up doors like crazy. Uh, I learned that from Songbringer. It's you've got to do your own marketing. It's very very important. In fact, I learned it from games before that where I did not do marketing. That's where I really learned it. It's like oh my gosh, this whole game just failed. I just spent two years of my life writing this video game. Nothing happened with the video game because I didn't do any marketing. Wow, that's a really important thing. So now that I know how important it is, I'm creating automation, leveraging the power of automation to help me do marketing better. And like you said, like I was, you saw earlier, to produce a better quality product. So, and to have peace of mind as a developer. So there you go, leveraging automation, more fun things being implemented. There's a lot of things I really did not even mention here in this, uh, um, because there's just too many little things that have been done and they're really not that visual. I mean, well, this is kind of what I could talk about. Yeah, the, the chest, um, when you get the chest, open up a chest, there's a whole bunch of items that can be good or bad. Now it goes and leans towards the good. So instead of, because I was noticing so a lot of times you're always getting these whammy items, these bad items. These are the bad items right here. Uh, the minifier, the scrambler, the firestorm, the snowstorm, the acid storm, all these things, to, it seemed like they were getting way too many of these and not enough of the good ones. So uh, I made it so that um, it's a 75% chance that it will produce a good item now. So there's only a 25% chance that it's a bad item. And, uh, and there's this new little feature to my uh, behavior um, trees called select rand, which is a super simplifies how it can um, select a random different behavior underneath it.
child behavior. So um, that's that. And then, oh man, there's music too. There's more music improvements. The music is, it changes its intensity better now. And there's also reverb applied. So I've got the reverb settings because the whole game um, is hooked up to F mod. And F mod is this really cool thing you can use to, um, like I can write procedural music. I can apply different, um, look at this. Look at all these parameters that we've got on the music. There's muffling, intensity, the index, which is of 0 through 11, or the 12 different musical keys, I can change the key of the music. There's randomness, there's there's all these settings for reverb too, like decay, early delay, late delay, high frequency, high decay ratio, etc. All those things are all hooked up now. So I did this for Songbringer, and now I'm doing this for Wraithbinder, where we've got this really cool immersive audio experience and adaptive audio. So as as more enemies come on screen, the intensity factor goes up. And as the intensity factor goes up, um, it increases the volume of this melody, it increases the volume of drums and things like that. So, uh, um, yeah, there's more to go through, but I already this video is long enough. So, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. All right, later on.